Unlike someone who got paid $33 million each year for doing nothing, Elon Musk contributes a lot to the commercialization of space travel. It could even be said that what he has done for the rocketry is worth many times more than the money he received as CEO of SpaceX. And one of his most memorable creations is the incredibly powerful Raptor rocket engine that powers the Gaint Starship rocket. Not only does it possess advanced technologies, such as a full-flow staged combustion cycle and the use of the futuristic propellant Methalox, but it has also been significantly upgraded to become more modern and powerful. Indeed, SpaceX recently blew the public away with the debut of a new masterpiece, the Raptor 3, which promises to be a turning point in Starship's development stage. Find out everything in today's TechMap episode. But before we begin, let's subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with the latest space news. In response to Tori Bruno's comments on X, Elon Musk swiftly posted a test image of the Raptor 3 with the caption, Raptor 3 first firing today. He followed up with a tweet showcasing ULA CEO Tori Bruno's comment, accompanied by a brief message, LOL. Musk provided further clarification in another tweet, all the small plumbing and wiring had to be deleted or incorporated into the primary structure because Raptor 3 will have no heat shield. Also, all parts have to be actively cooled in some way, so we added regenerative cooling where there was no existing fluid or gas flow. Gwyn Shotwell, SpaceX's president, took a more direct approach. She shared a Raptor 3 test image with a tweet, works pretty good for a partially assembled engine. Her tweet highlighted the phrase partially assembled, referencing Tori Bruno's previous comment. On August 3rd, SpaceX knocked the fans' socks off with the updates and image of Raptor version 3. The company also didn't forget to compare the new version to two previous ones to highlight its notable features. The performance statistics for the SpaceX Raptor engines have shown significant advancements across the different versions. The first one is thrust increase. Raptor 3 with 280 tons of force improved thrust by 50 over Raptor 2 and 95 over Raptor 1. By comparison, the closest engine to the Raptor that uses a phased combustion cycle with methane and oxygen is the BE-4 engine, which is expected to produce about 245 tons of thrust. The special version 3 surpasses the popular rocket engines, such as RS-25 with 190 tons. The RD-180 has 390 tons of thrust at sea level, but uses two combustion chambers and two nozzles reducing the thrust-to-weight ratio to 77.26, much lower than 183.6 of Raptor 3. While continuing to increase performance and manufacturability, SpaceX has managed to cut the mass of rocket engines. Following the principle, the best part is no part. Raptor 3 achieved a significant decrease in engine mass by 105 kilograms compared to Raptor 2, and up to 555 kilograms compared to Raptor 1. This suggests that the latest version could significantly reduce the dry mass of the Super Heavy booster by approximately 36 tons, which is more than a 10% reduction. As a result, Starship's payload capacity is enhanced, aligning with SpaceX's goals of improving efficiency and performance through innovative design. This potential mass saving is attributed to the elimination of the engine heat shield, which may be feasible in practice. So how did SpaceX do that? Elon Musk explained on X that, if we can delete and integrate enough secondary structure, small fiddly bits, then we can locally protect, rest, and delete engine heat shields. The shift towards a design that eliminates the need for heat shields indicates a focus on minimizing parts and complexity, which could streamline production and maintenance. However, this may also complicate repairs, as the new design integrates components more closely than before, requiring more extensive work to service the engines. Elon Musk mentioned this during a part of Everyday Astronauts' Starbase tour. Clearly, with the heat shield removed, the Raptor will be exposed, so it has to have cooling. So there's integral cooling circuits throughout the, all the parts. So it looks very simple on the outside, but it's complicated on the inside. Like even all throughout the, like the pre-burner and the yeah. gas manifolds and everything, it's it, all... It, all that stuff you see stuck on the side disappears. And of course, the heat shield isn't the only part that's been removed. And we also eliminate a whole bunch of bolted and welded joints especially the bolted joints. You really want to get rid of those. Yeah. Above all, the Raptor version 3 is designed for rapid reuse, which means it integrates components more efficiently, potentially simplifying the engine's structure while boosting performance. With 280 tons of thrust, V3's thrust-to-weight ratio is improved compared to previous versions, 
The key to this lies in the pressure inside the combustion chamber. Raptor 3 chamber wall might have the highest heat flux of anything ever made, Musk said. As the pressure within the combustion chamber rises, the propellants, fuel, and oxidizer are forced to combust more efficiently. This leads to a higher temperature and pressure, which enhances the energy released during combustion. According to Newton's third law of motion, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. When the exhaust gases are expelled at high velocity, they create a reaction force that pushes the rocket in the opposite direction. This enhanced thrust enables rockets to carry heavier payloads, achieve higher velocities, and undertake more ambitious space missions. A higher chamber pressure leads to a greater thrust output, enabling a higher thrust-to-weight ratio. This ratio is crucial as it signifies the amount of force the engine can produce in relation to its own weight. A higher thrust-to-weight ratio empowers the rocket to carry heavier payloads or achieve enhanced acceleration, thereby expanding the range of missions it can undertake. Furthermore, the importance of chamber pressure extends to the design flexibility of rocket engines. Higher pressures offer engineers the ability to achieve desired performance characteristics while maintaining compact and lightweight engine designs. This flexibility is crucial in enabling the development of advanced launch vehicles like Starship capable of fulfilling various mission requirements, including crewed missions, deep space exploration, and satellite deployments. Every time Elon Musk announces a new milestone in Starship's development, it creates a buzz in the space community. Perhaps it comes from people's natural curiosity for things that are beyond their imagination. And Elon's recent shocking revelation about the Raptor engine is no exception as he showed the world a Raptor's new record. Honestly, this engine is growing like a storm. So how powerful is the new SpaceX Raptor engine? Why can SpaceX do that? Find out everything in today's episode of TechMap and I think ultimately we'll probably, the booster engines, we'll, we'll aim to get the booster engines over 330 tons of thrust, which would mean 10,000 tons of total thrust at liftoff. For context, it's important to note that SpaceX has already made impressive strides in engine thrust with Raptor's fourth version. By extrapolating from the data of the booster with a thrust of 10,000 tons of force, it's straightforward to calculate that Raptor 4 would have a thrust of approximately 303 tons of thrust. However, Musk emphasized in the comments section his aspiration for even higher thrust, stating, hopefully, higher thrust. The long-term goal is 330 tons of thrust. Even with a projected thrust of 303, the Raptor 4 engine's power is nothing short of extraordinary, nearly equivalent to half the thrust of the legendary F1 engine on the Saturn V. But a thrust-to-weight ratio, TWR of F1, is very humble at 94.1, whereas this data for Raptor V4 is up to 202. This figure is truly mind-boggling, especially when compared to the benchmark TWR of the Merlin 1D engine, which stands at 180. For Raptor V3, the company also achieved a remarkable increase in thrust, elevating it from 185 tons to 280 tons. However, the huge power is not the only advantage of V3 and V4. The Raptor 3 also will not need a heat shield. So Ra Raptor 3 looks, looks very simple, and it is actually simplified in a lot of ways. But a lot of the complexity is hidden because we have integral cooling channels uh, in, in many parts of the engine that, that don't exist in Raptor 2. So in order to not have a heat shield, it has to be very resilient. Once Raptor V3 can work perfectly without a heat shield, the V4 can do the same. This is considered a full explanation for Elon Musk's previous statement about the removal of the heat shield on Raptor's later versions. According to Elon, this is due to integral cooling channels. So what does it mean? In reality, Raptor V3 and 4 will integrate most of the external plumbing lines and manifolds seen on Raptor V2 into the walls of the larger, inherently more robust components. To harden the V3 and 4, SpaceX engineers started to practice on Raptor V2. It has far fewer small external cooling lines and sensors compared to V1. Many valves were combined into valve plates, helping further simplify plumbing. On the original version of Raptor, while SpaceX was learning how to control the engine, a very large amount of development sensors were needed, allowing them to track pressure and temperature throughout Raptor's plumbing. And now they don't need them anymore. Additionally, 
Installing those small cooling lines on the outside of the engine is dangerous. They are vulnerable to being shaken around when the rocket is running, a factor in both reusability and relight reliability, and to the re-entry forces of both heating and being buffeted by shockwaves, along with being exposed to neighboring engine RUD shrapnel, not to mention being a possible source of that shrapnel. By removing a large amount of these components, SpaceX has made the engine more flame and heat proof, as well as prevented the risk of explosion due to the broken external cooling lines. Not only that, this will make the final assembly much faster and easier. Imagine that you just connect all the main components together and skip all the time consuming fiddly small plumbing. It sounds comfortable, right? Yeah, it's a huge bonus for applying the first principle thinking. For SpaceX's CEO, the single biggest mistake made by smart engineers is optimizing a thing that should not exist. That's why running through the first principles is mandatory in the incredibly complex rocketry industry. A smaller bonus is the lightweight enabled by the integration of the spaghetti of plumbing into the walls of the larger components. As a result, the Raptor V3 hardware looks rather similar to the simplified diagrams of how the Raptor engine works or the simplified models of the engine. The simple design contributes to cutting down on maintenance time between missions, meaning faster Raptors turnaround. On June 2019, Musk tweeted that, since Raptor produces 200 tons of force, the cost per ton would be $1,000. However, Raptor is designed for approximately 1,000 flights with negligible maintenance, so cost per ton over time would actually be roughly $1. Wow, approximately 1,000 flights with little maintenance. Why? If that dream comes true, it will be SpaceX's new record because their best operational engine is the Merlin, which can just be reused a dozen times, if I'm correct or the most reused engines in space exploration history were the main engines on each space shuttle, which flew up to only a few dozen times each. Seriously, what specifically about Raptor makes it anywhere near capable of that compared to previous engines? Something about the seals slash bearings slash materials slash full flow producing max enthalpy? Elon Musk answered that question as follows. Other rocket engines were designed for no or almost no reuse. Raptor is designed for heavy and immediate reuse, like an aircraft jet engine, with inspections required only after many flights, assuming instrumentation shows it good. Using hydrostatic bearings certainly helps. This leads to another question. How many flights is the Merlin actually good for with no major refurbishment now that you've reflown it so many times? Is the bearing the limiting factor, or is it the coking? As Elon said, Merlin could probably do 1,000 flights too. Turbine blade fatigue cracking would require periodic weld repair or replacement, probably some seals and bearings as well. Coking is not really an issue. For Raptor turbines, they are designed to mitigate that issue. Those turbines run at much higher pressure, but lower temperature. Thermal shock and strain are what fatigue Merlin turbine blades. Solvable for high reusability, but better to apply that engineering to Raptor. Another notable feature of the Raptor is the type of propellant it uses. At its core, it's like other engines, burning chemical fuel to produce thrust. But Raptor is considered the first engine using liquid oxygen and methane, and its innovative design means that it just might be SpaceX's ace in the hole when it comes to exploring the solar system. Methane prevents a buildup of deposits in the engine compared to other fuels like kerosene, a process known as coking, while its higher performance allows for lower costs. Raptor also uses what's known as a full-flow staged combustion engine, only the third engine in history to employ this technique, whereas Merlin uses the more common open cycle system. The previous two attempts at such an engine, one in the Soviet Union in the 1960 and another in the US in the early 2000s, never made it beyond testing. A full-flow stage combustion engine refers to how a pump spins a turbine to drive the engine, using what's called a pre-burner to get this process going by, injecting a small amount of fuel. Normally, some of the propellant is expended in a traditional open-cycle engine to start this process, but Raptor will use every drop of propellant available, making it one of the most efficient rocket engines ever built.
Raptor burns that fuel at a high enough pressure that can then steer the fire from pre-burner back into the combustion chamber and completely burn that propellant with the rest of the propellants, says space consultant Charlie Garcia from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it does this in. A very clever way that only the Russians have done previously by putting all the propellant in the engine through the pre-burners. The end result is that Raptor has a much higher pressure than Merlin, making it the highest pressure rocket engine in existence and leading to its aforementioned larger thrust than Merlin despite its similar size. SpaceX has developed Starship with the main goal of carrying both crew and cargo to Earth orbit, the Moon, Mars, and beyond. Coming from Musk's dream of multi-planetary life, Starship is the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed, capable of carrying up to 150 metric tons fully reusable and 250 metric tons expendable. Its capabilities are very impressive, being able to carry up to 100 people on long-duration interplanetary trips. Beyond that, there are other functions such as satellite delivery, the development of a moon base, and point-to-point -point transport here on Earth. Most notably, can't help but mention a state-of-the-art technology promising to be the game-changer in the future, on-orbit refueling. Starship leverages tanker vehicles, essentially the Starship spacecraft minus the windows, to refill the Starship spacecraft in low Earth orbit prior to departing for Mars. Refilling on orbit enables the transport of up to 100 tons all the way to Mars. And if the tanker ship has high reuse capability, the primary cost is just that of the oxygen, methane, which is extremely low. Upgraded versions of the rocket, including Starship version 2 and version 3, are expected to further enhance these capabilities. However, building a settlement on Mars will not become to reality if we can't afford the expensive transportation services to get there. It's the reason why SpaceX aims to lower Starship's launch costs using economies of scale. SpaceX aims to achieve this by reusing both rocket stages, increasing payload mass to orbit, increasing launch frequency, creating a mass manufacturing pipeline, and adapting it to a wide range of space missions. The full reusability is a significant shift from traditional expendable rockets, allowing SpaceX to reduce the costs associated with building new rockets for each launch. The goal is to achieve rapid turnaround times, similar to how airlines operate, which can drastically lower the cost per launch. Starship is designed to carry a much larger payload compared to SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, with the capability to transport up to 150 metric tons to low Earth orbit, Starship can accommodate larger and heavier payloads, making it attractive for a wide range of missions, from satellite deployments to crewed missions to the Moon and Mars. This increased capacity allows for more efficient use of resources and better economies of scale in launch operations. By establishing a fleet of Starships and Super Heavy boosters, SpaceX aims to increase the frequency of launches. A higher launch cadence spreads fixed costs over more flights, thereby reducing the average cost per launch. This strategy is expected to make space travel more accessible and frequent, akin to air travel. SpaceX plans to implement a mass manufacturing approach for building Starships and their components, similar to assembly line production. By increasing production efficiency, SpaceX can lower the costs associated with materials and labor. Estimates suggest that if SpaceX can scale up to producing multiple Starships per week, it could achieve significant cost savings, potentially reducing the cost of each Starship to around $10 million per launch. Last but not least, Starship's design allows it to be adaptable for a wide range of missions, including satellite launches, crewed lunar missions, and even space tourism. This versatility means that a single vehicle can serve multiple markets, further enhancing its economic viability and spreading costs across different types of missions. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.